ready. Let's make sure we are all set on this side. Her. Let's see what we got. We live? Are we? Yes? No? Maybe? So? Are we good on, are we good on your yep. side? We're, we're live on this end. This all right. Showing over for me. Awesome. What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to episode two of The Gunsmith Show. <laughs> Dude, that dude, that just song just gets me hyped, man. Like I'm vibing. Yeah, man, it, it makes you want to get going, don't it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So welcome back, everybody. My name is Joe. I'm with Shooting Gallery in England. We have my co-host, Swamp Dog Army. Swamp What's up, Dog. Cody? Doing good. This is episode two. We got this. This is this is gonna be a fun show. We got some great people in the chat out here. Let's see before we get into it. Uh, we yeah, got I was Mike. wanting to give some shout outs. Yeah, we'll give some shout outs. We got Mike McClune out there. Uh, we got our buddy flying rich. We got safety doc out there. What's up? Shout out to safety doc. Hell yeah. We got Kiaski. What's going on? Uh, let's see. I'm in the chat, obviously. Uh, why is that? That is not me. Oh, that's probably you because you did that in the chat. Okay, so apparently I'm in the chat and Swamp Dog. Yeah, yeah. Each... I was gonna say I clicked the wrong button. <laughs> write that okay i thought we just got hacked uh hps is out there we got christopher baker what's up and then he says that is the best intro on the internet reminds me much of opening for magnum pi back in the 1980s hyped that what's up dude and we got appalachian gunner we got some cool people on the chat here so cody how you feeling man this episode two you excited i'm excited i'm ready to get going all right now i said that the music and intro and stuff just makes you want to jump in there and go. And uh, I know that uh, you're fixing to inform me of some stuff that I'm not too too well versed on when it comes to the minutiae of some of them state regulations for folks that's in the, behind enemy lines, so to speak. Yeah, I'm I'm about ready to educate some peeps up in this some bitch, but. Uh, before we get into the conversation, guys, uh, we are sponsored by Mission First Tactical. Please check Mission First Tactical out for all your AR-15 accessories. We're working on a code. Uh, you, that's a big thanks to uh, Cody over here. I didn't even know that until last week. I was like, well, hot damn. And then also, of course, use hashtag Joe Juice uh, for your discount code at agesguncare.com. You can save yourself 15% off your entire order. Oh, we got oh, it's Chris from Mad Custom Arms. Hell yeah, what's up, dude? Um, so yeah, we got we're, so second show in, we got a sponsor, and uh, I I feel pretty safe. And uh, I do also want to mention, guys. Um, I don't know if you knew, you've probably seen this making the rounds today, Cody. Uh, a dear friend, uh, Richard Hoffman of BWE Firearms has had a tremendous. Uh, just like the worst thing that could possibly happen to him. He, uh, Monday, he did, uh, his wife, uh, Mickey or Michelle, um, unfortunately passed away from, uh, from what it sounds like when I watched on, uh, John Crumb show, she had a heart attack, unfortunately. Um, Richard Hoffman is a dear friend of mine. Uh, and we're trying to do everything we can to help him out. There is a link. In John Crump's video, I think after this, I'll throw the link in our description. Please consider going over and helping them out after being diagnosed with stage four cancer. Um, they're going through a lot, and any little bit can help. Um, let's try and help one of our own guys. So please consider helping out uh, Richard Hoffman and BWE Firearms. Uh, yeah, it, 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 I felt I, my heart goes out to. Richard Hoffman and his family, they've been in my prayers all week. Uh, I did just want to get that out there because um, it's different when something like this happens to one of our close friends. And I love Hoff, and 
if there's anything I can do to help him, I told him I'd be there for him. So we got Dark Mavis. So we got DLD after dark in the chat. We got some glowies in the chat. <clears throat> now that we did that, let's talk about. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Cody. So yeah, the uh, if you can get that in the live chat or in the description of something, that would work. So working on it. All right. Awesome. Awesome. So guys, tonight, episode two, the gunsmith show. Uh, I'm excited. We're going to be talking about some rules and regulations in terms of gunsmithing. So what do you guys think? What, what, Cody, what do you think when you hear rules and regulations? What, like what, what's the one thing that comes to mind? Someone wanting to tell you what to do, which a lot of us folks <laughs> that go go against the grains with that. But you gotta you gotta you gotta abide by the rules to do the stuff the right way when you're doing stuff for a business and stuff, or make that choice to do stuff on the you know more of the outlaw stuff and then deal with the consequences. But you got to know what 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 the rules are to know if you're breaking it or following it. Exactly, exactly. And I'm going to go out on a limb here, and you would agree with me, Cody, but we're going to be talking about laws that I personally think are completely unconstitutional and should not be a thing. Uh, many of these bans and regulations that we as gunsmiths have to follow when working on guns, mostly more modern stuff, but it does work in cases of uh, some older type firearms that we have to kind of just know Um I personally think, uh, yep, yeah, we, yeah, Chris Baker out there, it's all about the paperwork. Yes, there is more paperwork up in your business when you're a gunsmith. I despise doing audits and getting on sure, make sure the gunsmith paperwork is uh, in order. Um, so I think, yep, we and I was, I was gonna agree with you that I, I also am one that, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm of the opinion that all the rules and regulations when it comes to guns is unconstitutional when it is in our second amendment that shall not be infringed. That pretty much sums it up in black and white right there. So anything that is an infringement on that is unconstitutional. And I also want to point out too, since we're going to be going over it on all of this, the ATF, especially recently for folks that is in the gun gun world knows all too well, they're, flip-flopping like a fish and changing their mind willy-nilly on stuff and setting rules or whatever that they're acting as laws when they are not a law-making body. They're a law enforcement agency. So when you got someone that's trying to make the rules and enforce the rules at the same time, that's way too much power there especially when it's all stuff that they shouldn't be doing in the first place. But I digress. Exactly. So when it comes to rules and regulations, paperwork, and how we don't go to jail, all right, I'm I am too pretty for jail. I, you know, I got that Boston accent, and, you know, that's only going to get me so far. And I'm, I'm just not one to go to jail. Uh, especially when you're working on guns, guys, and customizing guns, you need to know what you're working on. Are you in what they like to call compliance? Are you in uh, the legality standpoint of is what you're working on, are you legally licensed to work on that gun? So when you're becoming a gunsmith, there are technically uh, – we're going to say two, technically three, if you consider a, class, a type two FFL, which is like pawn brokers and stuff like that. But the main two FFLs you are going to have to worry about when uh, becoming a gunsmith is becoming a type one or a type seven SOT. A type one is your basic gunsmith, uh, your basic FFL for a storefront. And um, it, if you want to become a gunsmith or... If you decide to be an SOT where you're able to work on SOT is pretty much you become a manufacturer. Now we are broadly going over this. There you're also, is... uh, sorry to interrupt there, but you're also skipping the class three, which is the dealer license, but for class three or NFA items as well, but not the full manufacturing side. I thought the class, get, 
Well, if you're just a class three. one, then you can't transfer or sell NFA items. Yes. It has to be class three. Okay, cool. Thank you for clarifying that. Also, I thought class three was Curia and Relic license for some reason. I, I, did, I think did. that's two. That's no, no, class two, two. I, from what I believe, is no, yeah, you're right. Curia Relic is like a five or six something. It's some, yeah, they FFLs out there, guys. We're just kind of going over in terms of gunsmithing. So, if you become an SOT, you're able to manufacture, and there's a lot more stuff that comes with that. Now, once you get your license, okay, so you're following the rules, you're getting licensed to become a uh. You're getting licensed to work on firearms, deal in firearms, uh, whether it be NFA or just regular firearms. Now, there is a broad range of requirements you have to follow. Now, say, for instance, you want to start dealing with modification of rifles or shotguns. The big thing that everyone's got to follow is something called the National Firearms Act. Cody, do you want to talk about? You want to explain what the National Firearms Act? For those who don't know what the National the NFA is, uh, I'm I'm just we're gonna brought, we're gonna go over the National Firearms Act because that is what you got to deal with for uh, terms of overall length requirements. Uh, you gotta know pretty much. Okay, is this a legal uh, firearm? What? Uh, but before we get into all that, what is the National Firearms Act? For those who don't know, just a moment. I'm pulling it up a screen share here. Oh, okay, cool, cool. I, I, I but um, we're just uh, all right. Oh, look at you, your Wikipedia too, like a boss. Oh, look at that. So, uh, the National Firearms Act was enacted in. Oh, you want to go through this, Cody? I don't want to be. You know, completely pirating the stream. No, it's all good. I I was letting you do what you're doing, and I was pulling up the stuff to go along with it. So, it's all, all right. good. But on here, like you can see, it breaks down the types of things that are covered under the NFA, which is all different types of guns, or more technically, firearms. That uh, for those that ain't familiar, for people that uh, are into guns and stuff, anything that you've paid a tax stamp or you've heard people say, I got to pay a stamp for that. The stamp is in reference to the National Firearms Act, and that's the fees to be able to have them items that's covered under it, which is machine guns, short barreled rifles, short barreled shotguns, suppressors, and which also is technically silencer the legal definition of it even though people frown upon saying that in the community and then destructive devices and then you also have another category of any other weapon which is literally anything that doesn't follow or fall under those categories specifically yep definitely uh, so HPS is out there saying I am a 07 slash SOT built 10 round MG 10 machine guns and registered them with the ATF came and took them after they approved them because they said I did it the wrong way. Well, dude, that sucks, man. I'm sorry to hear that, dude. Oh, man. Yeah, that's, that's... one thing that's very important and deal, especially doing with uh, NFA items. You have to do everything all in the proper order. Yep. In the, and, and just as, uh, Christopher from uh, Mad Customs was mentioning it's all about the paperwork and yep. their processes, which goes back to them rules and regulations, which cover what them processes are. Exactly. And uh, shout out to Gun Doctor TV out there. What's up, dude? Thank you for swinging by. We also got CNT and Joe Morgan out there. What's up? DLD After Dark says it was created to prove civil uh, to prove civilians out of arming themselves with effective weapons. I would tend to agree with that. And then CNT Design says the National Firearms Act is the first act to use interstate commerce clause to give the Fed the power to regulate firearms. You are correct. Um, now, uh, so let's describe what a, for instance, short-barreled rifle. The ATF and under the uh, National Firearms Act defines a rifle as a firearm with an overall length of 26 inches 
and the barrel has to be a min a minimum of 16 inches. So for those who are trying to work on guns, and this is how they again say that again. Can you hear me? No, I heard you, but I th I wanted you to repeat how you had said it. I think you was mixing two things together. Was I? Yeah, there's some. I again. I, I, was you referring to short barrel rifles? Yeah, short barrel rifles. Yeah, a short barrel rifle is anything under sixteen. Yeah. Inches. Uh, a regular rifle to be classified at, uh, to not fall under a short barrel rifle has to have a minimum length of sixteen inch barrel. Yeah, that's what I said. I said they were they. Um classify a rifle as a rifle that has a overall length of 26 inches and the barrel has to be a minimum of 16 for it to be a rifle anything yeah, that's, that's, that's where i meant that's yeah. why, that's where i had yes yeah. i didn't didn't catch that part don't, don't worry yeah don't worry i got you um so anything under that is considered a short barreled rifle so if your barrel is say 14.5 and you're pretty much it's the easiest way is okay. How long is the barrel? If the barrel is longer than is is under sixteen inches, it is considered a short barreled rifle under the National Firearms Act, um, and what the ATF and which requires you to have a two hundred dollar tax stamp for you to have that. You have to fill out the proper paperwork. There's a couple different ways to do it. You can do a trust, or you can file as an individual. So um, we're not really going to get into trust individual in this show. More of towards of like what you need to know when you know you're a gunsmith and you have something at the bench or a customer brings this to you and you need to know like hey listen if you want to do this you have to file all the proper paperwork for you obviously not to go to jail I'm not gonna lose you're not gonna lose your license for it um so yeah I, I just want to uh, point out uh, Kiaski had a really good uh, question or comment that kind of goes along with what we're talking about where the overall length or an SBR for it to be considered an SBR or an any other weapon and all of that stuff. It used to be that the they wanted you could measure it with your brace or stock extended if it's a collapsible stock. And what he said it goes for the longest length. It's not necessarily the longest length. It was more that's the way that it was uh designed or supposed to be used is with the stock extended so that's why they what what they took that measurement for but they've changed that where one of the going back to what we said where they flip-flopping and changing their minds on stuff now if it's a collapsible or a folding stock brace what have you the measurement is from whatever the show the shortest configuration is if it's a folding thing it's with it folded if it's a collapsing thing, it's at its shortest configuration where it bottoms out. Correct, correct. So then next would be short barreled shotguns. So for those of you who have seen like, you know, the little Bonnie and Clyde stuff or some Mad Max gear where it's like a little, you know, you get like a Remington 870, cut the stock off to the pistol grip and cut the barrel all the way down to the magazine tube. That is a short barreled rifle. Or if you get like a single shot or a, uh, um, double barrel shotgun and you just chop the barrel all the way up to the forehead to make a little like, uh, coach gun type deal. Yep. You're going to be pulling. I look, see Cody's already pulling up some examples here, uh, for those who are watching. Um, so those would be consider those are examples of short barrel shotguns. Uh, do you how about this, Cody? I went over short barrel rifles. You go over short barrel shotguns. <laughs> hey, that'll work. Yeah, a, sh a short barrel shotgun is what uh, people is probably more familiar with the term of a sawed off shotgun. Yes, and that that's where the barrel is less than eighteen inches. And uh, same thing. I'm, I'm, uh, let me. Double check real quick to make sure I'm giving people the correct uh, definition. But I believe it's the same overall length. And the barrel length is 18. Uh, feel free to chime up in the comments, any of y'all. Yep. Um, so for shotguns, the minimum, uh, the the minimum requirement for the barrel length has to be 18 inches. Anything under 18 inches it is considered a short-barreled shotgun. Uh, so 
How and now, guys, when you're actually yeah. at the bench, yeah, overall right? length under 26 inches and a barrel, uh, sorry, yeah, and a barrel of uh, less than 18. So yep. it is still the 26 inch overall. Yep, yep, for definitely. the shotgun. And uh, but where things get a little bit confusing on the shotguns is because the term sawed off is in reference to taking a regular shotgun with the full length uh 20 however long hunt your your standard hunting barrel and chopping that or sawing it off to a shorter length what uh, what's really popular now is like with the the remington tac 14s and the mossberg shock waves and stuff like that and how that gets away with it without being a, considered a short barrel shotgun is because those were made from the start in that configuration well, it that wasn't is made as a shotgun and then cut down. Yep. And again, those guns are actually made as firearms. They are determined as firearms, not shotguns. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I didn't mean to uh, no, no, over, no overlook that uh, that uh, specificity, but the, the whole reason for that is because for a shotgun to be a shotgun, according to their rules and regulations, it has a stock to be shouldered an overall length of 26 inches or more and a barrel of 18 inches or more. Let's take something like the shockwave, for example, that does not have a stock to be shouldered. It only has a, a pistol grip or bird's head grip, like some people call it. And it has a barrel less than 18 inches, but it still has an overall length total of at least 26 inches. So it's not considered a shotgun because it's not going to be shoulder. So that's why it's considered a firearm, but not an NFA item. Of course. Yes, definitely. So, um, so again, please, guys, one thing you have to understand, too, is when you're measuring this, a quick tip is when you're measuring barrel length to make sure to see what you have, always make sure the bolt is closed. OK, whether it be on a shotgun or a rifle. That's how the ATF measures it. When the bolt is closed, and you take a you take a dowel rod or you know some I, what I use is a cleaning rod, and I make a nick on it. Uh, a measured uh, you know I'll put a piece of tape right with it. It meets the very outside of the barrel, and um, then at, when I take it out, that's when I measure. Okay, what is my barrel length? Um, yep. Perfect example right here on the screen here. So now again, we're just, if you ever have any questions for any of us, please make sure you reach out to one of us on Instagram. And again, we're trying to, hold on. So I'm reading Kieski's comment here. So yeah, I was just checking Dark's comment. <laughs> How did you ever do that without assembling it? All right. So what we're we're yeah, I want to uh, I want to jump in on Kiaski's previous comment here, <clears throat> where he says once a rifle, always a rifle. That goes back uh, goes with uh, what's really common now with the ARs, people building ARs and stuff. If you take an AR receiver that was never built, just a blank receiver, period, it can be made into a rifle or it can be made into a pistol, or it can be made into a short bear rifle, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you buy it as the blank receiver and you build it as a rifle, once it's built as a rifle, it's considered a rifle. You can't put a shorter barrel upper on it and take the stock off and then make it into a pistol. And if you buy one, like say, go out and buy a Smith & Wesson uh, MP15, for example, or insert name of AR here, you can't buy a AR rifle and then change the upper to a short barrel because it's still considered a rifle because it was made that way. And I think that's kind of what, what he's getting at where he's saying once a rifle, always a rifle. Yep, and I'm also going to address this comment here. So this is what I'm when I'm talking about like measuring. This is when you either have it in your shop. If we're not, we're trying not to cover a lot of manufacturing because we can go way too into the weeds. We're just giving you guys a broad overview. 
So say I have something at my shop and I'm double checking overall length. That is how you install the barrel. So, I mean, uh, I mean, sorry, not how you install the barrel. Okay. That is how you check you the length of the barrel. You want me to jump in and uh, answer? I think I got a better answer for yeah, this yeah. question. Uh, uh, for, for example, take this shotgun in the picture here. If you was wanting to say you, you had a, a shotgun and you bought a new barrel, that happens all the time because barrel swapping on shotguns is really easy, especially a pump. You just take this little uh, cap off and you can swap it out. In order to properly measure the length of that barrel that you're wanting to put on it before you put it on it, because again, the order of how you do stuff is important. Once you put it on there, it's on there. If it was wrong, you did it wrong, even if you didn't know you did it wrong. So to be able to check that, the, the best way to do it is you're going to have to have your shot. Like say, for example, if you, I'm assuming this looks like a Mossberg here. That is a Benelli M4. Well, anyways, I couldn't <laughs> tell from the picture. But for, you, I you can want, tell. You, want, you want to disassemble it to the point where you can have your bolt and that barrel. Because you want to put your bolt into the barrel the way it would be as if it was locked up. Because the proper way to measure it is sticking the dowel rod or cleaning rod, whatever the case is, to that bolt face. Wherever that bolt face is, is what the what the ATF actually considers their measurement from. It's not, you like say, you can't just take the barrel by itself and literally measure from the front end to the back end of it. That might not necessarily be your actual measurement that the ATF is concerned with. Because when the ATF measures it, they're going to measure it just like that picture with it put together and the bolt closed and all that so that it sits against that uh, your uh, breech face. Yeah. So as yeah. long as you have a way to be able to tell where that breech face would be, that's how you can measure the barrel without it being assembled or on whatever the firearm is. Same thing with a rifle. It's just with a rifle, you have to do something like what you said, like a cleaning rod or something like that because you don't have as much room as you do yeah. on a shotgun barrel yeah yeah definitely definitely so that is pretty much the overview of short barrel shotguns next we're going to talk about suppre suppressors okay a suppressor is you got to fill the proper paperwork make sure you live in a state that allows suppressor ownerships i think as of now there's still seven states that do not allow suppressor ownership of any capacity i know massachusetts is one of them uh i believe i think california is one of them i don't know because there's there's some i almost positive california is one of them but there's there's seven states that do not allow suppressor ownerships um so uh real quick i do see christopher baker out there he says i always cut my barrels to 16.5 overall length just for liability issues and i let my customers know that length yeah smart way of doing it um just so you ever get an overzealous ATF agent that's so just like, did you bring your snacks? Oh, okay, never mind. Sorry, my wife just got in. Um, so uh, just so you ever get an overzealous ATF agent that wants to say, well, this isn't it. Okay, listen, if they're going to be like that, cover yourself and make sure that you are over 16 inches. That's a great comment, by the way, Chris. Um, now, is this the uh, s states that do not allow suppressor ownership? Yes, the uh, eight states that oh, explicitly eight, okay. ban suppressors uh, from civilians owning suppressors is California, Delaware, Hawaii, Illinois, Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York, and Rhode Island, and the District of Columbia, but they ain't a state even though they want to be. <laughs> Throwing Connecticut and Vermont allow suppressor ownership but prohibit using silencers during hunting. Really? Oh, I thought uh, Connecticut was one of the states. I didn't know that. Oh, that's oh, learn something new every day. Uh, so, um, yeah. So, a suppressor is a suppressor. Silencer is how they're you know cat they're categories of silencers. Um, well, that's one thing, Pete. You you got to realize all of this stuff. A, the first time any of it came out about is, is, as far as being actual black and white legal definition terms is back in the 30s. So you got to think common terms back then is stuff being thrown around by literal gangsters and bootleggers. You got height of prohibition and all of that stuff, which led to some of the regulations that we have now 
But in all actuality, there was a lot more to it than that. That just ended up being the main scapegoat that the the common Joe or Joe public uh, goes by. And uh, where y'all are talking about the lengths of the barrels and stuff like that, the a good part of that, uh, talking about the 16 and a quarter, or 16 and a half, or 18 and a half, that's the reason why those is pretty, like a 18 and a half and a 16 and a half or 16 and a quarter are your, like your standard sizes for buying aftermarket barrels from insert name of manufacturer is for that exact same reason because it's not measured by the actual barrel, but from the length of the end of the, uh, the end of the muzzle to the uh, breech face that accounts for any type of variation in head spacing or this and that. And from, from actually assembling it, any tiny gaps that that might be, it gives you a little bit of leeway. Well said. Safety docs out there. So dark, I do want, I'm not uh, forgetting you dark. Uh, so that stop touching buttons. <laughs> you touch Y'all let you do it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. So, Dark, we will discuss this on another show. Um, when it comes when it comes to that, I'm not dismissing your comment. I just want to let you know I hear you. Okay. I will point out uh, on some of these things that's a, that's a little bit more on the detailed stuff, like asking about that. I will be expanding on some of these topics on tomorrow's podcast on the Swamp Talk. Yes. But for now, we're just trying to like go over some like the basics of what the regulations and stuff are that most people will come up or come across or have to deal with. Yep, yep. So Safety Dog says Al Capone had free soup kitchens in Chicago during the Great Depression. Three meals a day, free, no questions asked. Well, look at that. Uh, that's I, I did not know that. Safety Dog's out there dropping some knowledge. Go check out Safety Dog's channel, by the way, guys. Um, so the only one I do want to cover that you will might encounter as a gunsmith is an AOW. Best way yeah. to uh, and any other weapon is the the best example I know of is you have a Glock 17. You think you want to put a vertical pistol grip on your Glock 17. That makes it a AOW. Now and a uh, quick pop quiz for anybody out there in the comments: Why is that configuration an AOW and not a short barreled rifle? I'm gonna see who gets it. I'll bet you anything, Chris is gonna get that. Still waiting. Yeah. All right. Well. well. Well, that, that, that comment will be coming in soon. Uh, Man Against the Masses is out there. What's up, dude? Thank you for joining. Um, Ginger so, Billy is a funny dude, by the way. I have no yeah, Shout I have, out to Ginger Billy. I was going to say, I, I have no idea. I, I, I'm going to pull up a video or two when, when the show goes off while I still got you in the green room. Yeah, so HBS right is there. out there. Yep. Vertical grip, AOW. No stock. Exactly. So that is one thing you have to be... Uh, <laughs> I like uh, masses coming because they said so. Well, that's that's right too. Yeah, that's true. So okay, now we kind of briefly went over AOW, uh, briefly went over the NFA. Now the next <laughs> set of laws that I think is pertinent, especially in states, because I deal with this on a daily basis, is you're going to hear terms like pre-banned. Now. If you guys are at the, you're working at a shop as a gunsmith, or you're trying, you're trained to become a gunsmith, and you're seeing customers coming with guns, and say, "Oh, I have a pre-ban." All right. Uh, uh, so that comes into effect in 1994. The Clinton assault weapons ban, the 94 assault weapons ban, that made pretty much every gun they named. It's like. 20 something firearms you could not manufacture or sell uh it, it, it it's a very well documented i don't really want to go over the complete logistics of it because again but if you guys don't understand pretty much they banned the features of a firearm so any gun that was made before 1990 the the effective date of 1994 it went for 10 years and sunsetted in 2004 um, they're saying it was going to stop violence and all. It didn't really do anything to curb gun violence. Um, uh, so, um, 
pre-band would be before 1994. Uh, that means before 1994, that gun, especially in terms of, say, Massachusetts. All right. Massachusetts, there's multiple assault weapons bans we have to follow. This, again, I'm just going off of my personal uh, experience. Um, now, say if you're trying to build an AR, for instance, the receiver, if it's the receiver is made after 2004, it is considered a post band. Okay, so that means that gun would have to fall under those regulations, meaning you could not have a threaded barrel. You could not have a barrel nut. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, uh, bayonet lug. You had to have a fixed stock in the state of Massachusetts. Again, this is not everywhere because I know after that, every, we adopt, in Massachusetts adopted their own assault weapons ban after 1994. Uh, they just kind of, it never sunsetted in Massachusetts. So if you're in a banned state like this, You'd have to know these laws and, like, you know, follow your dates. Like, when does your receiver add up? Um, so, in that case, for in terms of Massachusetts, that type of AR, you would have to have a, again, pin stock, uh, pin stock, or a non collapsible stock. You could have a pistol grip. You they only ban they banned one to two. I think it's two evil features. So you could have an attachable magazine and a pistol grip, but you couldn't have a threaded barrel, a bayonet lug, a uh, collapsible stock. Now, any receiver that was made before 1994, it was fair game. You could have a collapsible stock. You could have a pistol grip. You could have a threaded barrel or a uh, bayonet lug or you know some scary flash hider. You know, God forbid, a, an A2 flash hider is more effective than anything else. Um, so, there's things you got to know. In terms of that. So say if you're at a bench, especially in a band state, we have to follow stuff like that. Um, this is not for the whole country. I'm just giving my personal experience on stuff and rules and regulations that someone like me has to deal with. Um, now, if you're building an AR and you have a pre-1994 receiver, okay, that receiver is obviously a, the serialized part is considered the firearm. So that receiver was made... Uh, you can call the manufacturer and look it up. You can tell if, depending on the manufacturer, Kiaski. So, for instance, like Olympic Arms, those are big pre ban receivers in my state because I don't believe Olympic Arms even makes firearms anymore. You can you can clearly tell. I know Colt. You can look up serial numbers. You can call the manufacturer. Um, so uh, it just there's there's ways to know about it. Um, Hold on one second. Warsaw Patriots just joined the chat. What's up, dude? All these laws due to entrapment of people that accidentally get people in trouble. That's true. Um, so say if you had a pre-1994 receiver, that means you can build uh, upper that obviously allows to have a threaded barrel or a non-pin and welded muzzle brake. Uh, you could have a classical stock because the receiver is the pre band firearm. Sorry. Someone was making noise. Um, so, say you don't have a receiver. Now, for instance, Massachusetts has two assault weapons bans. There's the one that went before July of 2016 and the one that went after July of 2016. <laughs> uh, so, Maura Healy, our Attorney General, decided to reinterpret the law. So that means guns that were made at, you cannot get newly manufactured firearms in the state of Massachusetts in terms of like ARs and AKs after July of 2016. So guns made before July of 2016 fell under the old assault weapons ban where you had to have a pin and welded muzzle, uh, non-collapsible stock, all that goodness just to own a semi-automatic firearm that we all know and love. Anything after, it's a no-go. Some states, I'm guessing California has the same laws. I don't know California's laws as much as I do, uh, as much as the next person, because I live in Massachusetts. California is a whole different animal. Same thing as New Jersey, same thing as um, uh, New York or any of these states that have these draconian laws. Um, you have to know assault weapons bans. You have to know, again, these rules that make sure you don't get in trouble with your state or federal laws. Um Magazine capacity is also an issue. For me personally, I have to pin mags to 10 rounds. You have to know, does your state off, uh, uh, make you have a 15-round capacity limit or a 10-round mag capacity? 
if your state lives in those, if you say, if you're at a gun shop, it happens to me all the time where I have to, uh, um, dark, I'm uh, sorry. I was reading a text. Um, if we get guns in that are high cap mags, meaning anything over 10 rounds, we have to put limiters in them and drill a rivet through. Um, meaning we have to block those mags and make them pin. So they're pinned mags to make them 10 rounds. You can't easily convert them into a high cap magazine. Um, so one thing it's, I can't stress enough is if you're working in a state that has to deal with these types of laws and regulations, please follow them. You do not want to get your license pulled. You do not want to end up in jail. Um, <laughs> it's that we're, we're unfortunately we have to follow the paperwork as our friend Chris said. Um, yeah. And that's the ma- the biggest difference between a uh, individual and a gunsmith uh, working as an FFL. You have to f- be a little bit more uh, on top of things and following things because you're pretty much expected to know better. Yep. Yep. And, and I and think uh, any, any violations that you do, even if it's not necessarily something that might land you in jail, like being an individual, once you lose your FFL, that's it. You're not going to be able to get another one. Yeah, you can. Um, never I mean, you, you can always, there's different things depending on what it is that you can appeal and stuff like that. But even that, that you're going to be years down the road if you're even able to get that. But once once you get a revoked license, that's pretty much it. You might as well be looking to do something else. Yeah, it, it, there's no way in hell you can work in the firearms injury if you get a revoked FFL. Like, it's going to be incredibly hard unless you want to pay hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars to uh, get your rights back. And you're pretty much spending that money to go against the ATF. Um, So now, Cody, what else do you think we should be talking about? Again, we talked about some stuff you got to follow. I talked about stuff I got to deal with in a banned state and the uh, regulations I have to follow in my state. Um, You're more of an 80% guy than I am. Would do you, uh, I think it's time we cover a little bit of 80%. Yeah, that'll be good, uh, cause especially considering that's one thing that if the ATF has their way, what they're wanting to do is pretty much putting an end to all of that, which that's one thing that really, really irks me because I'm from the camp, so to speak, of the DIY builders. I'd rather do something myself or at least modify something myself over anything that I could buy, whether that's a vehicle, whether it's a computer, whether it's a gun. It don't matter. That's just how I am. And the freedom of being an American gives you that to be able to do what you want as far as like making something yours and it not be like everybody else's. But when it comes to gun stuff, that's where all these regulations come in. You can't just go do what you want to customize your thing. You have to make sure that you're following the right rules. And like with the 80% stuff, it's people have been able to build their own guns. And if we go way back, you know, before America was America in the first place, people was literally making things from an 80% because 80% is not even a real thing. Just like a loophole is just a political term or what have you. 80% is something that's just a marketing term for selling stuff. The actual regulations There is no percentages of a gun is a gun or a gun is not a gun. As far as ATF is concerned, the rule is it either meets the definition to be a gun or it does not meet the definition to be a gun. It's black and white. There is no gray. There is no in between. So the 80% is just a marketing term for something that is close enough for you to be able to do the minimal amount of work to it without having to just do it all from scratch, but it is still not to the point that it is considered a gun. Well said. Very well said. And then with their uh, the proposed rule change to be doing away with the 80% receivers and wanting everything to be serialized goes back to what we mentioned in the beginning of the show with the ATF not being a lawmaking body, but with them recently kind of been allowed to make changes to the regulations and stuff as they see fit and then treating it as a law it's not a law but because they're the ones enforcing it 
it pretty much has the same effect as if it was a law, but it didn't go through the right processes to actually be voted on and passed as a law. It was just, okay, we want to, uh, we, we was wrong for the last 40 years or whatever. We, we should have been doing it this way. So we're going to do it this way now. And now hundreds, millions, what have you people that was following their rules because they decided overnight to change what those rules are is now breaking the rules and doing stuff illegally. And a big, a big uh, recent example of that for uh, like some of the younger folks, this newer into guns is bump stocks. Bump stocks was a hundred percent legal. It was nothing but an accessory. It wasn't even considered a firearm period because all it is a piece of plastic. It replaces what would be considered the stock of a gun but because the atf decided to change their uh rules about that they turned that piece of plastic in their definitions to be a machine gun by itself even if it's not on a gun and heaven forbid you put it on a gun now you like have double machine guns exactly and i will and i will say it wasn't just most of the atf either it was Obviously, the bump stocks is a special case that was brought on by the pre- uh, by actually President Trump. He put pressure on the ATF to ban bump stocks after the, the unfortunate uh, shooting in Las Vegas. Um, that's why, again, knowing starting, I'd say voting at your local and county levels, starting from the small grassroots before they get up to the national scale, is very important. Um, everyone depicted trump as this like savior of the second amendment um and he literally is put this stuff into place and what we're fight with the goa and fpc and all these people are fighting in court because he said yep ban these bump stocks and then the wording of that ban is why we are fighting so hard because it's very dangerous so again it wasn't just all atf President Trump did. Well, but that's that's the problem, though, is yeah. that it it was done through the ATF, changing exactly. their regulation by the changing the word and, like you said, the wording that they change that is not actually part of a law going through Congress and our our actual lawmaking process that was laid out by the founding fathers, just like the Second Amendment was laid out trying to prevent some of this stuff to make it a little bit see they had so much uh foresight to be able to see ahead of us dealing with this garbage we're dealing with now to try to write stuff in advance to keep it from happening and then you have the like for example atf but the atf isn't the only government organization that steps outside of them bounds in the first place. They're just the main one that deals with gun stuff, which is what we have to follow. Yeah, exactly. Um, so back on in terms of 80% firearms. Um, yeah, good, good uh, as well. Uh, gun doctor. He says he was also pro red flag laws. Um, yeah. So again, that, that, you know, I think, this podcast, uh, we have to deal with politics, unfortunately, here and there. Uh, I don't want to get too heavy into this. Next, I like I. The reason why I want we wanted to start this episode after the pilot as rules and regulations, guys, is because it kind of obviously reference a lot of this stuff when we go talk about other like stuff when it comes to like building firearms or like specific episodes when it comes to like ARs or AKs or bolt action rifles or shotguns or anything like that we will be referencing some of these laws so this isn't what this podcast is going to be but as a gunsmith you have to know the laws you have to know make sure you are in regulation of the ATF your local state laws federal laws you need to know this um in gunsmith school when i went to sdi and when cody did we had i believe a whole we had a whole cl- a whole like class on stuff like this from what i remember um yep. I-, I think that was literally the entire class was just learning this stuff um, well it's also like you said like, like for example for doing the show and that we have to cover this stuff because so much of anything else that we could be covering 
is still going to fall under this. And like so many people have already mentioned, asking about certain specific things under rule A, for example, that we have to go over them basics of what the rules and regulations are to cover before we can go in depth on some of them specific topics. Yeah. And just know, guys, when you get your FFL to become a gunsmith and you go into business, you're going to get about a book like this thick of stuff the ATF is going to give you to know your rules. Like, no, 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 the laws. Like, you need to, like, you're going to know all, especially when it comes to getting your FFL and like all that stuff. There, you have to have that stuff on deck. Um, we're not even going to get into battle. That's a whole set in terms of stuff like for regulations from bound books and how you run your shop. Uh, I think if we ever have um, Chris from Mac custom arms on, uh, I'd love to get his take on it and stuff he's probably dealt with. And uh, it just, you know, stories that, you know, can help someone determining what you, what, you know, what to do and not to do to make sure you are in compliance, which unfortunately I hate that term. Um, but uh Yeah. Dude, we're man, we're killing it. We're at 51 minutes so far. Yep. Man, we're killing it. Read out uh Kiaski's comment. He said he thinks his IOI, which by the way, for those that are not in the gun industry or working as an FFL or a gunsmith, IOI is the inspection officer that checks up on stuff dealing with your FFL. So there's someone that's kind of supposed to know what it is that they're supposed to be checking up on. And he said his IOI said he had three months of training on laws and that even he didn't know all of them and let that sink in. So again, Damn. that that's the person that is supposed to be uh, enforcing and checking on all these rules and regulations and laws that you're supposed to be following. And even that person, there's so many of them that the person in charge of enforcing that doesn't even know what all they're supposed to be enforcing. Yep, and again, guys, the ATF there is there to make is not this like fire like yeah we don't agree with the ATF, but Chris Baker has a great point. You can also call them and talk to them about getting definitions to make sure. Hey, am I doing this right? Is this how it's supposed to go? Because again, they're going to be there when they're in for inspection. Yeah, well, I also want to point out too uh, that that's a big deal or uh, not a big deal, a big difference from the perception of like say your average joe shooter uh just gun guy uh consumer versus a gunsmith or an ffl holder in the business side of things and someone that might be trying to take that step from being a consumer to being having their own ffl to do some gunsmith work and stuff like that the atf is not someone that like uh it's not this big doom and gloom fire breathing dragon to be afraid of even the inspectors and the agents and all the stuff the people that will be the ones checking up on you they're all going to be there trying to help you to make sure that you do the things the right way and you don't make some of them mistakes to misstep or whatever they're not there to just breathe down your neck and try to like break you on every little thing that you're doing wrong they're there to help you to make sure you don't do things wrong and to give you the education of them different regulations or step the process to say like for example I, I forgot who it was that mentioned building the machine guns and then getting them confiscated because they it was done in the wrong order the ATF folks is the ones that's going to help you make sure you do the right order that they're not yeah it's like anything else there is going to be some bad apples in there period but for the most part especially the folks that you're actually going to be interacting with is people that's there that's just there to try to help you succeed yeah exactly because you also um, got to think about it too if their job is to like enforce stuff and you know crack down get on to the folks that actually is breaking the laws making and selling and you know putting machine guns out there that, you know, actual machine guns and whatever, actual criminals, they're not going to go out and do more work for themselves than they actually have to. So the more that they can help someone to not be a criminal, the less work that they're having to do. 
Exactly. Joe Morgan actually makes a great point. He says, I'm not anti-person. I get that per that they have a job and stuff. I just dislike the way it use it's used as a legislative body to pass laws. Exactly. Yeah. Like you're you're for especially inspectors for coming up on audits and making sure that you're, you know, when ATF comes in to check your books and stuff like that, they're there to do a job. Depending on where you are in the country will probably depend on how like, you know, like for instance, you would think Massachusetts, that would be a, I, I, from what I hear, I've never actually dealt with the ATF. When I had our inspection, I had COVID. So I was not uh, there and I, work my ass off before i left to make sure that was all set um but uh i've heard stories of like the atf inspectors being like pretty chill for the most part they're not there to bust balls they're just there for a job uh they're they're there things like this they're there to uh they're there to make a paycheck to be quite honest unless their bo their big bosses are putting pressure on them uh gun doctor makes a great point i just don't think they as the atf should even exist i agree Gun Doctor out there. Big shout out to Gun Doctor TV. Please, guys, go check them out. Go check him out. Great dude. That's another good, good gunsmith. We'll have to get on the show sometime to share some of his stories. Oh, yeah. And I'd love to hear the some of The mad scientist he's... of the gun world. He's like a jack of all trades in terms of the gun world. He just, <laughs> he's done it all. Like, not just in the gun world, but like, he's just such a fascinating person of like what he used to do, like, whether it be law enforcement, gunsmithing. Uh, I think he was like an MMA fighter. Like he just has like this like dude should just write a book, to be quite honest. I'd love to just read a book. Reality T V show star. Oh yeah, yeah. Reality T V show star. Uh Star Wars aficionado. Uh I could we're just pretty much spouting off the resume of uh our friend Daniel of Gun Doctor T V. <laughs> but so guys, we're coming up on a full hour here. Wow, Cody, we I'm yeah, surprised. things have been rolling right along. Like I said that that intro just gets you pumped. You want to just yeah, keep going. dude. I I'm probably gonna like listen to that on my way into work, just like getting hyped. Like, okay, we got this. Let's do this. <laughs> oh man, I heard that today, and I was showing everybody at work. I'm like, listen to this, and they're like, dude, that thing's pretty sick. Uh, so um, so I'm surprised we yeah, got sorry, this long. I was just checking the, some of the comments, making sure I, we ain't missing something that. Is yeah. really good for our uh, topic today. Yeah, definitely. So, what do you think? Uh, let's put it to you guys. What do you guys want us to talk about next week? We're going to talk about some cool nerdy stuff next week. Do you want us to talk about gunsmithing the 1911? Do you want us to talk about AR 15 builds and like tips and tricks? Do you want us to talk about, um, say, troubleshooting? Like, you know, process of elimination of okay this gun is doing this malfunction what do you guys want to see let's get some ideas and me and cody will kind of wrap our head around what we're going to have a designated topic a topic about and again this podcast we will have gun we will have like guests on the show uh periodically not every single week most of the time it's just going to be me and cody um but i do want to again remind thanks our sponsors uh mission first tactical for sponsoring this show we don't have a code yet but we will have one soon uh get all your fantastic ar-15 accessories uh at missionfirsttactical.com or wherever they are sold uh i would say my favorite product from mission first tactical is their minimalist stock i have it on my 16 inch more uh we the people 2020 build we did that on the channel that is probably my favorite stock you could ever put on an ar-15 uh, and obviously use hashtag Joe juice at your checkout at ages Uh, last I heard that they're actually getting, they're getting pretty stretched out on product. They're almost, sometimes they're out of stock. I was recommending them last night and they said that, yeah, they're sold out of, uh, the, the Joe juice and the cleaner or the lubricant and the cleaner. So I want to hear more. I want to hear about gunsmithing horror stories. <laughs> uh, Oh, we could do that. Definitely, I could definitely do. I could. Well, that's the thing. I if that that'd be tough because I don't want to like name customers, and I don't want to because like some of these can be very specific. Where if the customer ever were to hear this, they could be like, "That they're talking about me." So that's that. That would be pretty tough. Um, well, but at the same time, though, 
if you've had something that was worth a story being shared, then you got to own up to the learning moment that you caused. You can't get too upset about that. Well, it wasn't even stuff I caused. It probably just. Well, I'm, I'm talking. I'm talking about the the customer, like you said, the the yeah. person that the story is referencing to. If it's something that's story worthy, then you got to kind of give a little leeway for that. Yeah, that that's true. I could probably talk about well, like like I said, we could probably do a whole video on just stuff I've messed up. Uh, or a whole podcast episode. Uh, Joe Morgan has um, a great idea of building a good budget upper. Uh, that actually might be a good idea because considering our sponsor, Mission First Tactical, um, and then my good friends over at Bowden Tactical. Cody, I have your sticker pack coming. <laughs> tactical girth? It's not that. It's tactical girth. Uh, yes, Warside Patriot, I will check out the link that you sent me. Fluffy, oh, look, Fluffy 10 millimeter Jeep guy. What's up, buddy? Thank you for joining the chat on the very ass end of the show. Knowing, oh, here we go. This is a good one, Chris. Knowing the best place to take your firearms for repair. That, that, we could go down a couple different rabbit holes with that topic. What do you think? Yeah, that was gonna say that's that 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 could be a, a couple of episodes by itself. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Hmm. Okay. Well, we got some ideas that we will toy around with. Um, but obviously, yeah, guys, I just want to give a big thank you to feeling. all y'all that have been out there in the chat and watching and being active and stuff. It's because of y'all that we're doing this in the first place. So the more that y'all participate it gives us uh like like joe was mentioning give us ideas of what it is that y'all want to hear so that we don't just sit here and ramble for an hour and stuff about stuff that y'all ain't even interested in <laughs> yeah exactly uh hey boys nice thumbnail and rebranding oh well i appreciate that, I appreciate P80, that. p380 wilbur that is all so the thumbnail, the opening commercial. Are we gonna play that on our on our exit? Do you want to play that? Because yeah, I was gonna say I could play it again real quick if you yeah, want. I mean, it's I, worth it. We're 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 over an hour now, so the yeah, we wasn't yeah, we're, around at the beginning. Can catch we, it. We got to get a closing so song that kind of keeps you just like relaxed and like hyped at the same time. But uh, I say we play that as our outro too. Um, but guys. <laughs> That see, it just gets you so hyped. Uh, well, Cody, I think we got to figure. Yeah, we gotta have to figure out like a outro uh, tune to like close the show out. Uh, so, again, guys, I'll we work wanna, on it. Yeah, we don't want to keep you too long. We appreciate you watching. Uh, please make sure you join me and my good friend Cody Swamp Dog Armory next week. Uh, we will hopefully be. Do you want to do Utrecht next week so we can actually show guns? Like, I think we gotta show some guns. Yeah, uh, we'll see what we can do. Next week, I'm actually going to be on the road going to the Palmetto State Armory Gathering uh, Range Day event. I hope to get some content and stuff out for y'all from there. And I'm also going to be from from there making a road trip down from South Carolina to Florida for the Gunmakers match in uh, St. Augustine on Saturday which is a big deal, especially for folks that's interested in gunsmithing, because that's the only or the first shooting competition that is strictly for folks that have built their own guns and putting emphasis on the hobby of building your own guns, including 3D printing and 80% 80, uh, 80 receivers and stuff like that. But of course, as we mentioned before, with these rules and regulations and stuff, some of that might not be lasting too much longer. Yeah, exactly. I'm still kind of jealous that you're going to the national match. I was going to, but I can't. I'm so I'm so I'm so sad I can't go because 
Uh, yeah. Uh, again, guys, please do me a favor as you're cl clicking off this video. Please do me a favor and go over to either John Crump, DLD After Dark, Flying Rich. They are doing a fundraiser uh, for Richard Hoffman to BWE Firearms. Um, again, guys, please check him out. He's going through a lot of stuff right now, considering he just lost his wife. Um, uh, he is definitely a member of our community, and he needs our help more than ever now. And uh, let's help one of our own. Um, I d please don't do not play that because I will start crying. I heard I was watching it this morning. And I burst into tears. Um, but uh, <laughs> I saw the video. I'm like, oh no, no, I can't, I can't. I'm gonna cry. I can't do it. Um, but please consider the link is in the top of the chat, and I will add this that link to the description on my video at least. Uh, so please go consider helping out BWE. I might be popping on the live stream to kind of just like show some support. Uh, so you might see me over there. Um, but as always, guys, I was just gonna say that's probably where I'm fixing to head over is to their live stream as well. I was wanting to point that out. That's why I had pulled up was Flying Rich's thing. But as you mentioned, there's quite a few folks doing it, and anything that y'all are able to do to help is a big deal. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, but yeah, this has been a great episode, guys. Again, please check us out next Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're still saying we're going to do Utreon, but the thing is, is life happens. I am busy as all hell at work. All my good guns are at the shop. I haven't moved all my rifles here. Cody is doing Cody things, so he's just all over the place. And I would say uh, be, be uh, go ahead and be uh, ready for the Utreon specific streams to start up in april yeah yeah definitely definitely but and uh, we'll right. have a lot more of actually handling guns and yeah. doing some gunsmithing on the show once we get it over on utreon it's gonna be a fun time it's gonna be as badass. someone mentioned in your video earlier youtube don't much uh ain't too happy about touching guns on a live. oh video. yeah dude someone thought i was like live and i was taught oh man no i'm i don't I'm, I'm not that ballsy uh but um as always guys please make sure you check us out every week at 9 p.m eastern standard time either on here or utron we're gonna try and do utron exclusively coming up we're just trying to get the people that are watching the show live um so uh we don't really have like an outro so all i can say is uh stay safe Stay shooting, and we'll see you next time. And y'all be good. Be good, guys. Have a good one.